So child sexual abuse is contact of private body areas of a child with an intent other than hygiene or um, caretaking. But there's other forms of that don't involve contact, things like exposing yourself to a child, things like showing them pornography, um, things like communicating in a sexual way by phone or by the internet. So who sexually abuses children is family members, household members, relatives. It's not strangers. It's people who live with the child, who have access to the child. In that child's mind, their perspective on it is that that's a person who lives with me and takes care of me. So uh, we don't leave our children with strangers. It's somebody who has access to them. So the people that we leave our children with are people that our household members, uh, family members, people who uh, we expect to do babysitting, things like that. It's great when children can tell us about it, but I'd say probably the most common thing is that a parent notices a change. They become suspicious because they notice that their their child isn't acting the way that they used to when they'd go to somebody somebody's house or they've noticed a change in the way that they behave. And it depends on how, what age they are in terms of what those behaviors might be. But um, the most of the time, uh, that's it's either going to be a parent who identifies something that they think is different or wrong, or a child will come forward and tell us. Okay. Well, the thing that we have to do is the hardest thing because... What we have to do when we hear this shocking news that just makes us sick to our stomach sometimes is that we have to, as much as we can, control the expression on our face, control our voice as we talk, because that child is so is totally focused on you, and they've just told you something that they have no idea what's going to happen now, because most children think it's their fault. They did something wrong. And they're going to be in trouble. And your impulses, you're going to have to fight your impulses and try to be as calm as you can be. And when you talk to them about it, it's saying things like, like, oh, I didn't know that happened. What happened? Very, very gentle, general questions, not probing questions. Um, because they oftentimes don't even have words for some of the things that have happened to them. So what should happen is that the first thing is somebody should take a report. And that's if you're talking to law enforcement or social service. If, if you're in the emergency room or you're in a clinic or at the school, they'll take a report of, of, a, of a type in that they'll get you know names, and phone numbers, and addresses if they don't already have that information. The most important thing is who did this and where are they? Yeah, so a physical examination is sometimes one of the first steps in healing because at a f many people, uh, many families, caretakers, parents, and the children themselves have concerns that what happened to them changed them in some way. It changed their body in some way. And that somebody can tell, you know, that they're different from other kids. So it's, and the good news is that 96 to 98% of children who've been sexually abused have normal exams. So they need to know that their bodies are okay. And the only way to really do that is to look at them and say, I'm looking at you right now. Everything looks great. You're perfect. You're fine. And the parents need to hear that too so that they can be reassured that their children are fine. So, and the exam is a very detailed, it's a very detailed evaluation, I should say, because it's three to four hours long. It's very detailed in terms of obtaining information and then offering guidance and support. And that, ju it just takes a long time to go through all that. It's a very complicated thing. The way a child or an adolescent will let you know is by their behavior. So they'll be acting a little bit different. So they may be a little more moody, agitated, depressed. They, things that they like to do before, maybe they don't like to do it anymore. 
Um, they can start to use substances. They can know a disruption at school. Um, if you notice their behavior around a certain family member or a certain person, they get um, angry or they get hesitant. They'll let you know by their body action. So it's really a lot of observation. Um, and to let you know, our, our children get groomed. So they're groomed by perpetrators like, like Dr. Arnella spoke of. So watching your child, having an open conversation with them. Um, validating validation is one of the most hardest things, I think, for, as a parent, as somebody that cares about a child, is just to sit and listen, um, to listen to what they're saying. Ask questions from what they're, what they're saying to you. Grooming is when a perpetrator specifically picks a child or an adolescent um, to sexually perpetrate. So they, have a, they can see different things. So like a single mom who's busy or a, a kid that's parents are getting divorced, they're distracted, or a kid that doesn't have, that's shy and doesn't want to go to a certain places. So they'll kind of see these things and say, oh, I can kind of get into that, get, get near or get closer to that person. Um, sometimes perpetrators will single somebody out and just give them more gifts. Mm -hmm. So they'll give them special gifts, give them special time, special attention. And that might even alienate the child, like, oh, uncle really likes you, you're his favorite. Or think, you know, it may create that isolation even more just by people observing that the, the perpetrator has picked the specific person. Groomers won't start off specifically touching, you know, a private part or a body part. They'll start with um, what I call a safe, what I've been trained to is a safe touch area. So your arm, your back, your leg. And then there's the, the not, the, you know, the bad touch, which would be the vagina, the buttocks, the chest. So a perpetrator is not going to start with those parts. They're going to start subtly um, so that they're grooming and getting them ready for what, would, what would they are planned to do next. So the other thing about grooming is that it pulls a child in. So now they participated in it. They become part of whatever action's going on. And in that child's mind, they did it too. I did it too. I went over there and sat on his lap. I went over there and got the toys out that we like to play with so that we could be close together and do this. And it's all serving the purpose of, of allowing this person who has this very deliberate intent, more and more access to the child. And pretty soon that, you know, they're saying things like, why well, I touched you right there. And now, you know, I'm touching the skin right here on your belly. is just like the skin right here, down here. So what's wrong with touching you there? So it, you know, children can't fight that kind of logic. They have no experience with any of this stuff. They have nothing, they are equipped with nothing. Teach kids to trust their intuition. Mm. That to trust their feelings about things. We as caretakers have to give them validation for that. When they say, I don't like that person. I don't want to go over there. I don't want to do that. Instead of just brushing it off like, oh, you're just, you know, you're acting up. They're trust asking them, why, what is it? Why don't you want to do that? And, and giving them val and teaching them that your feelings are important. They're going to tell you something. They're going to tell you if you're safe or not. If you're not safe, is that a feeling that's making you feel unsafe? Mm. And then here it's somebody who's a family member, somebody trusted. We're not going to expect that this person would do that. But the child is building that, is building that kind of understanding. And one of the most important things that they can do is under, that we can do for them is help them understand that they're right. Their feelings about this is right. So that comes, you can do that every day, all day with lots of different situations that come up with kids just by validating what they're saying and how they're feeling. So we do work and partner with um, New Mexico Sexual Assault Services. They have a curriculum there. It's called Healthy Bodies, um, Positive Relationships. And so they do go into the schools and um, at a very young age and the parents participate. And when I say young age, it's like pre-K, kindergarten. And they talk about you know, how to protect yourself and how to make sure that uh, you know how to use your body appropriately. And then what are these like good touch, bad touch, and what are conversations you could have if you don't feel comfortable. Um, something that we mentioned earlier was uh, listening to your children and having these conversations. Um, it also goes with just a simple handshake. In my experience, um, as adults, that may be more the respectful thing to do. But for children, um, forcing them to handshake with a stranger, mm -hmm. I would say is a barrier or um, uh, a boundary that we shouldn't cross. Mm -hmm. It's um, Let's normalize not having our children have to give someone a handshake, a hug, sit on their laps, 
and just really give our children a little bit more agency. And it simply can be, you know, telling the person, um, I just respect my children's boundaries and mm -hmm. they don't feel comfortable doing that. And that's the first way that a, that a parent can advocate. Sexual abuse is a, and sexual assault is a weapon. And it's a weapon because of the shame. Like if you look, listen to all those accounts in other countries that are happening, what's the first thing they do? They kill all the men and they rape all the women. And it's to bring shame and to break down a culture of people. So that is, you know, that is a very deep way to hurt somebody. And what's they're left with is shame. And so, and then in cultures where uh, being modest and being, you know, um, careful about your virginity and like who you were virgin when you get all those other things that lay on top of that, you could you break that all apart when you when you rape somebody, you sexually abuse a child. The as adult one is is an interesting question. Because it's hard. You can't force somebody to heal. Yeah. You can't force somebody to say, this happened to you. I need you to talk about it. It's You come at it in your own time. Um, and allowing yourself that time to, to feel it. A lot of times when you go through that type of abuse, you disassociate. So you build whatever it is inside you that you don't have to think about that. You don't have to, to think. You don't have to. Um, I have a friend who talks about trauma and cycles of trauma. So like when a wheel's going, there's a cycle of trauma. So when you want to stop that, that wheel's already going down the hill, right? It's not mm -hmm. going to stop with an easy force. It's going to take a lot of pushback to stop that wheel. So if you are a parent who has experience or in a family, picture that image. This isn't going to be easy. I may, I may slip back a couple of times, but I'm going to get back up and I'm going to stop that, that cycle. I'm going to stop that trauma that's happening. And it may take a lifetime. Mm -hmm. It may take healing isn't an easy process. It's not just one therapy session, a ceremony. It's, it's, it's a lifetime of healing. Our childhood is our formative years. That's where we learn about safety, about trust, about all of those things. So correcting them when that was violated, it's not an easy journey. Um, it takes a community. It takes a lot of people. It takes a lot of resources. So I would just encourage people um, to think about it in that analogy, whatever works for you within, within yourself. In the policy realm and having Navajo Nation leadership address it and, and acknowledge that it has happened, um, certainly has taken a lot of courageous conversations, uh, not only with uh, the subcommittee, but with other delegates who were then in um, confidential settings were able to disclose that they themselves. And so I think when we talk about policy, policy has to reflect the people. And it's a, it's a system that governs the people. But when you have individuals who cannot break through their trauma or break through their situation, then there's a silence, hmm. silencing effect. And what happens is you get laws that are stagnant and do not reflect what's currently happening because nobody's willing to talk about it. Because as a survivor, the last thing you want to do is have your perpetrator hurt someone else. Hmm. And so sometimes we'll the families or the victims will say, we do not want to prosecute because they don't want to be re-victimized by the system or victim blamed, victim shamed. Mm. Why were you there? What were you wearing? Um, but to have a system that truly heals them and heals their family. And I appreciate Dr. Nala saying healing comes from the families. We're so, we're a nation that's built off of our families, right? When we introduce ourselves, we're introducing our extended families. And so it's going back to the family and know that there's healing there. There's, there's knowledge there and there's hope. There's hope when that sun comes up in that early morning sun that, that we have a new opportunity to provide protection to our children. And here on the nation, we, we do have uh, registered sex offenders, but there is, um, not enough services for them to get the help that they need as if they're jailed and, and have a sentence, they come back into the community. And if there are family members, then they're coming back into the community where their victims live. And sometimes we have had, unfortunately, you know, parents side with the perpetrator and then the child is out of the home. 
And so we have to be very clear on what's happening and how we continue to protect our families. In the work that we do, we just continue to promote to watch over anybody who's there. So this is a family advocacy center, and so it's it's in the same vein. Um, we have uh, what we call child advocacy centers, where it's a central location where a family can go to receive services. So here at Seattle Medical Center, you have the medical services, you have the counselors. Um, it's also an area where law enforcement can come and interact. What we're trying to do is expand this type of service across Navajo Nation. When talking to our federal partners, because any sexual assault is a federal crime, coming to a medical center is already a trip. And so we don't want families having to do multiple trips, multiple um, interactions. They could have an advocate and the advocate helps them go through the process. And if it goes and, and is prosecuted, there's, there's an advocate there who could help, but also we need an advocate to help with the aftercare. And that's something that I think all of the resources can say that we could bump up more and, and provide that family additional resources because you're not automatically healed when the judge decides what happens to that perpetrator. So I, I mentioned that ceremonial context, but we still need specialized psychologists, counselors, who can assist um, as they re-enter. Most of them are on some type of probation, but after the probation ends, then those resources also end. So there has to be the, another gap where um, we're learning from border towns or, or state type of agencies that they have um, built up joint programs. And um, they, akin, they also mention that these perpetrators need a lot of help whether it's like rejoining the workforce, mm. they need help in terms of housing. Like I mentioned, they may return to the same small community where their victim lives. And so we really need to look at where is a place where we keep individuals safe, but also an area where they can, the perpetrators then can, can have their livelihood. Google you do Navajo Nation sex offenders and it, it'll, it'll pop up. Oh, yeah. wow. okay. It'll do a picture, a profile, last known location. So just remember that they could have changed since they took their picture, maybe gained weight, maybe lost weight. But they It also takes the will of the people. Mm. And uh, the people need to elect leadership that want to combat and, and, and change these, these injustices that are happening. I think the last thing I'd want to add is how these all intersect. These yeah. are not in silos. Mm. And so I appreciate the conversation where we're looking at what creates the environment for sexual assault. Um, I think uh, we're seeing a lot of intersection when it comes to violence, when we come to substance abuse, drug addiction, to numb trauma pains. And we're not, we're not um, superhuman here. We're just um, five-fingered individuals who uh, are using our talents and our knowledge to help protect our children. So thank you very much. If this has brought up a lot of past experiences, uh, we just want to let you know that you're not alone and that there are people here who want to have those conversations and validate it and, and look at options as far as resources. Thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, for being part of this. Thank you. I appreciate your courageousness to, to hear it. It's, it's hard. Yeah. Yeah, that's yes. all right.